Hey everybody at Western Heights. It's good to be here this morning. Uh, happy Resurrection Day. Um, he is risen and he is risen indeed. If you were in front of me, that's what you would say. But today, things are different. But that's all right. I'm glad you joined us in our worship time uh, with the music. If you weren't able to do that, uh, I would encourage you to take that YouTube video and go back and uh, re-watch that and see that all the things that uh, we did and the, and the people that put their time and effort into uh, giving us a little video, a little little hello from wherever they are. But anyway, uh, we're glad you're here and I want to take a minute and uh, get into the Word. That's what Easter's about. Jesus came out of the grave today. Our faith is solid and it's founded on Him and it's founded on the Word. And so we're glad um, of what happened today. I hope you got to see the sunrise service. If you didn't, it's on there. We had a great time uh, at sunrise service, just the nine of us maintaining our social distance, doing well. Take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to the book of John. Uh, John chapter 12 is where we're going to be. And I'm going to bring a message this morning that's entitled, A Grain of Wheat. Uh, a Grain of Wheat. And I'm going to talk about the hour uh, that Jesus speaks about. He said, My hour is come. Uh, and we're going to talk about the hour that Jesus spoke of related to his death and his resurrection. And so what I'm going to have you do is turn there in your Bibles to um, John chapter, six, or chapter 12. And we're going to begin reading down in verse 20. And so John chapter 12, verse 20. Trust that you found uh, that. If you found that in your Bibles... Um, I'd ask you to say amen, but you're not here. Um, I'll give you a, a minute or two longer um, if you're turning and looking for those Bibles. It is definitely good to be here. I hate that we're not within in the same building, in the same room, but um, it's good to know that you're out there and that we're together. Okay, John chapter 12, uh, verse 20 is where we're going to be. John 12, verse 20. And the Bible reads like this. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee. And they asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And Philip went and told Andrew. And Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever loses his life or hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now, is my soul troubled? And shall I say, Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, Glorify your name. And then a voice came from heaven and said, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. And the crowd that stood there heard it and said that it thundered. Others said, An angel had spoken to him. And Jesus answered, This voice has not come for your sake, has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. And he said this to show what kind of death he was going to die. So the crowd answered him, We have heard from the law that Christ remains forever. How can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? And Jesus said unto them, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have, have the light, lest the darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, 
believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for uh, these things that are written in your word. Uh, We thank you for grace and mercy. We thank you for the empty tomb. We thank you that uh, the women and Peter and John ran to the tomb on this Easter Sunday morning and there were angels there that told them that, that Jesus, who is crucified, is not here. He is risen from the grave. God, we ask you this morning to speak to our hearts. Um, and if there be anybody here today who doesn't know this risen Jesus, uh, that today will be the day that they give their hearts and lives uh, to him, to follow him, to hate their life in this world, to serve him, uh, that the Father may honor them with eternal life. Uh, Lord, bless our time in the Word today. Do a work in Jesus' name and amen. I have fond memories in my childhood of cream of wheat. I know that sounds pretty strange. We had oatmeal at our house and we had cream of wheat. And it just depended on what day that we had enough of of what we ate. Those fond memories were renewed this week. As I ate some cream of wheat for the first time, I think, since I was a kid. It it was great. Or maybe it wasn't as good as I remember, but it was good to have a little bit of nostalgia. I think as I grow older, I think about those things uh, that happened way back when much more often. But as I thought about the renewal uh, of, of this cream of wheat, I thought about the grain of wheat that Jesus spoke about. And he said, unless it falls into the ground and dies, that it brings no fruit. And so I want to think about those grains of wheat, that one grain of wheat, Jesus, and how he fell and died and therefore brought much fruit. Now, this passage immediately follows the triumphal entry. And so Jesus had just come into the city uh, for the feast of the Passover Um, Jesus was uh, bringing a lot of excitement with him. Um, The news of his raising of Lazarus uh, had also kind of come along with him to where uh, there was a pretty good public stir. He was a popular public figure and people wanted to meet him and and see him. And uh, that's one of the reasons that these Greeks came to want to talk to him. So they came to Philip who was from Galilee, Bethsaida, and it was a Greek area, so they thought they may have had an in with Philip. So they came to Philip and they said, we want to see Jesus. And Philip, who uh, was one of the disciples, but he also knew that Andrew was very good at bringing people to Jesus. If you look at Andrew in the New Testament, what he was always doing was bringing people to Jesus. So Philip went to Andrew and said, okay, Andrew, got these Greeks that want to see Jesus you know, can we take them to see Jesus? And of course, Andrew is like, no, we don't take people to Jesus. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Animal or Andrew did say, yes, let's go take him to see Jesus. And so it looks as though when uh, we do see Andrew and Philip, Jesus speaks to these Greeks. Um, it's a little hard to tell in the text for sure, but it looks like that's what he does. And he begins to give this definition of what his death would be like and what his resurrection would be like. And so just to look at this text for a few moments, this hour that Jesus spoke about in verse 23 is what we're going to talk about. So point number one, uh, a necessary death. When Jesus spoke about the hour of his death, he spoke about a necessary death. And you see that in verse 23 and 24 as well as verse 27. Uh, It says that the hour had come that the Son of Man would be glorified. Notice that that was the intent. And he says, Truly, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. And then you've also got there in verse 27, he says, For this purpose I have come to this hour, Father, glorify your name. So that's what Jesus is dealing with here when he begins to talk about uh, his hour. Now, you notice he uses the words like unless and if. Uh, the idea there is clearly in any language, um, it's something that requires something else to happen. And so that's what's going on in Jesus's words here. He's saying, look, there's something that has to happen. And if it doesn't happen, then other things don't happen. So 
the fruit was necessary. And for a new global faith and for the salvation of billions, Jesus was symbolically this grain of wheat that must fall. And it was necessary for God's plan to be filled. And so this necessary death was about the Father and his plan. It had been planned from before the foundations of the world. And we know that Jesus never did anything but follow in the steps of his Father's will. He spoke what the Father spoke, uh, told him to speak. He did what the Father did it to do. He was a, he was a God-man, but he did everything that was in the perfect will of the Father while he was here on earth. And so this necessary death would be there for the resurrection. If he didn't have a physical death, there would be no physical resurrection. The ladies who went to the tomb in Mark chapter 16 and Matthew chapter 28 went with spices to anoint a body. There was a physical death. And the resurrection was light on the glory of God, fulfilled prophecy, testimony that would propel these disciples, and the justification would be secured for our eternity and our resurrection as well one day. That's what the resurrection was a foundation for, all those things. And so what we know to be true is that the resurrection is foundational. And to get that resurrection, there was a death that had to be necessary. So Jesus says, unless the grain of wheat dies, which is exactly what he did. Now this shelter in place order that we've been living under now for weeks, we have, uh, it's caused us to really reevaluate the necessities of our life. Um, you know, there's some items that we may have thought we needed before all this was going on. And then we've decided there's some items that we can live without and some that we can't really live without. Um, I guess toilet paper was one of those things that the whole world thought that you can't live without enough of, so we were going to be trapped in. But I think most of us have realized that's probably not something that we need to stockpile, even though it's a necessity of life, at least in our country. And I found out that some of these things we consider wants and needs, and we've learned to discern that. I got a letter or an email this week from uh, our uh, pastor friends down in Peru. Uh, one of them, uh, Pastor Indy, and, and also his wife um, named Najli. Uh, they live in Chosica, Peru. And uh, he sent me an email this week, and I asked him how things were going uh, uh, related to the coronavirus and the regulations that were in place there in Peru. I've heard a little bit about it, but not just a whole lot. Um, but he spoke about how that uh, all uh, everything was on lockdown, like complete lockdown. It had been that way for 21 days, and I guess they're probably up to about 26 days now. Um, men could go out on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Women could go out on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Nobody could go out on Sunday. Um, it was a, it's a difficult time. And so some of the, um, some of the means of income that they normally have were taken away. And so right now they've got a baby on the way. They've got two small children, I think like six and three or something like that. They've got a, a third child on the way and all of her, um, medical appointments have been, uh, canceled because the only thing they want a hospital is emergency situations. And so she's about 35, 36 weeks along right now, and they're trying to figure out how she can have the baby in a clinic rather than a hospital, because obviously the COVID-19 is a, is a scary time to have a baby. Um, he gets down to the end of his email, he talks about how that uh, God provided for them this unbelieving family to bring them food when they were running out. Uh, amazing things. But then he gets down to the end and he says, I can't write you a letter like this talking about all the needs we have without telling you how good God has been. He said God has been so faithful. God has been just there for us every step of the way. He has not left us. Um, we haven't had a need that has not gone without being filled. Uh, I think it was just an amazing testimony for me that these things in our lives are necessary for us to decide what's truly needy in our lives. And so this was a necessary death that Christ had. There was no other way for sin to be dealt with. There was no other way to have a wrath bearer for the sins of the world. 
There was no other way to achieve God's plan for salvation. It was ordained before the foundations of the world. And therefore, we must rejoice that the grain of wheat, which was Christ, died. We rejoice in his willingness and his determination uh, to complete the Father's will and to endure the shame in order to overcome death, receiving that only way to get to heaven. We should be grateful and just in awe of this necessary death. Number two, a glorious death. We see there in verse 23 where Jesus says the Son of Man is going to be glorified. That's his hour that he is coming to, the Son of Man to be glorified. And then we also see in verse 28 where Jesus says uh, to God, glorify your name. And God says, okay, I am going to glorify it. I have already, and I'm going to glorify it again. And so the second point this morning, not only is Jesus' death a necessary death, it was a glorious death. It was a glorious death. Uh, it was one of those deaths that achieved everything that it was accomplished to achieve. It was the promise before the foundations of the world that God would glorify his son. In fact, he says that as the, the Trinitarian God, the glory that they have will fill the earth as the waters do the sea. It speaks about how that God is a jealous God and he will not share his glory with another. And so Jesus said, okay, God, Glorify yourself now. Glorify the Son of Man now. And God says, okay, I have glorified it already, and I will glorify it again, because it's that time. And notice that in, this, uh, in these two instances, it's God the Father who is glorifying. Okay, He's the one doing the glorifying. And of course, this glorious death leads to a glorious resur resurrection. Uh, to glorify Jesus in this sense, it means to put on display or to make much of his holiness, his perfections, his excellencies, uh, you know, these characters about God, you know, and, and you may say, well, you know, how does, how does the death of Christ glorify Jesus? I mean, the death that he died was pretty rough. Uh, the death that he died was was not what anyone would call glorious, but nevertheless, that's what God said he was about to do. In the hour that Jesus was about to die, God said, glorify, I'm going to glorify you. Jesus said, glorify yourself. He said, I'm going to, and this is the way it's going to happen. You're going to be lifted up high above the earth. You're going to be crucified on a cross. But death can still be glorious. I read a story this week about a missionary in 1964. His name was uh, J.W. Tucker. And he was in the Congo. Uh, he was uh, there when a time of civil war broke out. And a lot of missionaries left. He decided that God wanted him to stay. And so he stayed. Uh, he did well for a little while, ministered the gospel. But then sooner or later, there was a, uh, a group of... Um, uh, a tribe of kind of feuding uh, tribes with a near group that came in and they attacked him, his little village, and they killed him, threw him in the river. A lot of crocodiles in that river and they uh, ate him up, um, you know, just bad stuff, okay, to happen to this guy, Tucker. Now, you think, wow, um, why is that Why is that important? What's the deal? Why That seems like a waste uh, of his life. Um well, what happened is down the river from where he was killed, there was a little village, uh, this village of the Mangabitos. And the Mangabitos had never been reached by Christ. And they, in the middle of this civil war, were very uh, out of the, the, the fight. They did not want to take sides, and yet there were still uh, a lot of warring all around them. And so they needed peace. And the government sent this guy who was a brigadier uh, general. And he was determined um, to, take them to, to take the gospel to them because he was a new Christian. And so he went there uh, to bring peace, which he urgently tried to do. But he realized that the only peace was going to come through Jesus. And so he, he heard of a, a tradition uh, with the Mangbados 
that said if a blood if the blood of a man flows down the Bamakade River, you must listen to his message. And it had been a saying in that tribe for a long time. And so when he learned that, he called the king and the people, the village elders, together, and he said, you know, some time ago there was a man. Uh, he is in the village, or he was killed in the uh, up river village, and his body was thrown into this river. Um, the blood flowed in your river. Before he died, though, he left me a message, because it was Tucker who had led uh, the brigadier to Jesus Christ, and so he preached the gospel there, and the gospel was received among the Mangbitos. And so we look back at that and we say, wow, the life of Tucker was not a waste. Even though he had been murdered and thrown into the river, his life was not a waste because the tribe downstream came to know Jesus. So in the death of the grain of wheat, much fruit was produced. In fact, it continues today in that particular tribe uh, that they know Jesus, they have churches, and they are ministering to surrounding villages. And so he says, I will glorify you in your death. But then the eyes of the Romans and the eyes of the disciples and the eyes of the Pharisees and the Jews, even up to this present day, his death was the opposite of glorious. It was, in fact, cursed. And as we look back, we can understand, yeah, we understand why his death was a glorious death. We understand why there was good in Good Friday. The glory was in the fact that the debt was paid. The wrath was absorbed. Righteousness was earned for all of those who would believe. And the glory of the cross would come in such a more obvious way in the resurrection. When the resurrection happened, the glory of the cross became evident in a way that, that even unbelievers could see. And so that glorification would have been both... The, at the pleasure of God, at the destruction of sin on the cross and the resurrection of Jesus from the tomb. And so there's this glorious death that God promises. And, I mean, what makes a glorious death? Is it because you're a martyr? Is it because you're a hero? Is it because you're a statesman? You've had lots of accomplishments or lots of impacts on others? Your character? There's a lot of that. But Jesus had a glorious death because it accomplished exactly what it was supposed to accomplish. Number three, not only was Jesus' death and resurrection necessary, not only was Jesus' resurrection and death uh, glorious, it was also effective. And you see this in verse 24 where it says uh, it's going to bring about um, the fruit because it's died. But also once you look in verse 31, this is real important. Because we know that there's fruit going to be uh, brought forth. We know that, um, that sin is dealt with. But look what Jesus says in verse 31. In verse 31 he says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. There was, in addition to the sin and the testimony and the fulfilled prophecy, a justification and, and our resurrection, in addition to all those things, Jesus said it's a time for judgment to come upon the world. It's a time for judgment to come upon the world. Andreas Kostenberger, who is a uh, professor where I went to seminary and a commentator now, a brilliant man, um, he wrote about the paradox of the cross. And he said, At the cross, the world and its ruler are judged, while Jesus is glorified and salvation is procured for all. Now, that comes from a, a, an understanding that this exact statement that Jesus said, Now is the judgment of the world. It's time for judgment in the world. Now, the text is clear here. Um, there will be a judgment. There will be a day of reckoning for all of us. Every one of us will stand before God and we will have to give account for our lives. Not just the fact of the good and the bad, but in the account of the fact of whether we knew Jesus or not, whether we had been born again or not. 
Even in this text that we read today, it spoke about those who will love their lives uh, up until the point where they grasp when they lose them. And then it talks about those who will hate their lives and they will gain eternal life. It talks about those of us that will follow Christ and those of us who serve Christ in this text. And then it speaks about those who don't. They serve themselves and they don't follow Christ. In this text, it talks about people who walk in darkness. It talks about people who are not following Jesus. It talks about those who walk in the light and were sons of light. Um, There will be those in this world who will fall into one or the other. Jesus says there's sheep and goats. He said there's children uh, of light and darkness. There's wheat and tares. There's good trees and bad trees. There's houses built on the rock and houses built on the sand. Those who serve God and those who serve Satan. There will be a judgment and all of us will be in it. Rest assured The cross was was the finished judgment. The the victory was won, but you are in one of two groups. In fact, we all are. Whether or not we know Christ, whether or not we've been born again, whether or not we have seen him with the eyes of our heart and not just the eyes of our intellect. Number two, he says here that not only judgment is coming for the world, look at the next word. He said that, the ruler of this world, this is verse 31, will be cast out. And so he speaks about the rule of the world. He speaks about Satan. And he speaks about this casting out of, of Satan from the world, this judgment, this, this loss uh, of Satan. He was used, Satan was, to carry out the mechanics of crucifixion. Okay? Uh, God allowed him to bring about those purposes of God and to do those things. And when that happened, though, his judgment was sealed. Um, His fate was sealed at the fact that the cross was won and the resurrection was coming. And he would ultimately be cast into the lake of fire, uh, which is a second death. And all who have not followed Jesus will follow him into the lake of fire. The battle, the decisive battle was won on Calvary because the accuser can accuse the brethren no more. One writer, D.A. Carson, a solid commentator, said this, the fundamental smashing of his, the devil, his reign of tyranny takes place in in the death and exaltation of Jesus. This brief statement, analogous to the apocalyptic scene of Revelation, the followers of the Lamb overcome the dragon by the blood of the Lamb. And when Jesus was glorified or lifted up to heaven by the means of the cross, enthroned, he too, or Satan, was dethroned. And so that's what we see in this, uh, in this judgment of Satan. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't deal with uh, the after effects of Satan. Um, there's this lingering time where God allows him to build up wrath for himself. And and during that time, we are um, tortured in, in our soul by the temptations that he provides for us. But no, Jesus said that in the hour of his crucifixion, the ruler of this world would be cast out. Why? Because sin is overcome. And when sin is broken in your life, then Satan has no power. He may tempt, but you have the power over Satan. His his loss was crushed at Calvary. And of course, we know when the tomb was empty on Sunday morning, it was just further evidence, further testimony of what happened on Calvary's hill was true and right and faithful. Jesus also says, finally, in verse 33, when I'm lifted up from the earth, He says, I will draw all men to myself. What a truth. Jesus says, when I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. Of course, the the biblical foreshadowing that this looks back to is in the book of Numbers when there was a bronze serpent that was lifted up on a pole. And on that pole, everybody who is 
uh, judged by this judgment, these, these serpents that bit him, was supposed to look at the bronze serpent on the pole and they would be given life. They would be healed. Uh, and that's what this is kind of looked back on. Jesus says, I'm going to be lifted up and everybody's going to be drawn to me or they're going to look to me. He would be lifted up and then men would be affected by the Holy Spirit to come to know him. That's the, that's the thing. He said, I'm going to draw men. How does that happen? That happens whenever the Holy Spirit comes to you and the Holy Spirit begins to work in your heart and life. It begins to open your eyes to the sin that's in your heart, that's in your life, convicts you of that sin, and makes you to the point where you are ashamed and realize that you have sinned against a holy God and you have offended the creator of the universe um, that you have uh, made this God an enemy of yours. And so when the Holy Spirit comes and convicts you of that, that's Jesus drawing you. He's, he's wooing you. He's letting you see the beauty of the cross because the cross doesn't look very beautiful in the eyes of the world, in the eyes of those who put Jesus on the cross. But the cross looks beautiful to us whose eyes have been opened to the fact that our Jesus, our beautiful, perfect Son of Man, was killed and the sin that, uh, that vexes our soul was punished and destroyed at Calvary. And so we can see the beauty of Good Friday. The bloody, horrible death was beautiful for what it accomplished for you and me. It, it, it's what it was supposed to do, and it's what it did. Again, that's what makes a death glorious. It's what makes a death effective. It's what makes a death necessary, is it accomplishes that which it has set out to do. Jesus promised, when I am lifted up, when I am crucified, I will draw all men unto me. So have you been drawn? It's Easter Sunday morning, and, and we think about the empty tomb and the resurrection. We think about the fact that Jesus said, I'm going to draw men to myself. Have you been drawn? Has the Holy Spirit worked in your, in your life, convicted you of sin, opened your eyes to the need of forgiveness, and set your eyes on the Son of Man as your only hope for that forgiveness to have. Has that happened in your life? Maybe it's happening right now. Maybe, maybe God is drawing you. Maybe you need that forgiveness that Christ offers, and He only offers that because He went to the cross and He died in place of you. He bore the wrath that you deserved. He bore the wrath that I deserved. And so when we put our faith in Him because He draws us, opens our eyes to that beauty, and we put our faith in Him, God saves you. He saves you. Now, maybe there are some of you watching who have never had that experience where God has saved you. Jesus says, the judgment of this world is coming, the rule of this world is cast out, and I will draw all men unto myself. Speaking about the death, he would die. And then, you know, we get to the end of his text, his end of his talk, the next red letters. In verses 25 and 26, we see it there where he speaks about laying down our lives or hating our lives rather than loving them and hanging on to them and clinging to them in this world. But look what he says in verse 35 and 36. Some more red letters if you have a red letter Bible. He says, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest the darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the light does uh, does not know where uh, I'm sorry the one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going while you have the light believe in the light that you may become sons of light now this is my therefore point this is kind of point four but not really this is just therefore we've seen the necessary death we've seen the glorious death we've seen the effective death therefore what Jesus tells us he is the light of the world. He is the one that you need to believe on. That's what it says. Believe in the light in verse 36 so that you may become a child of God, a son or a daughter of God. That's what Jesus said. He said, therefore, trust in me, follow me, serve me, believe in me. 
The cross and the resurrection was for the glory of God and for the salvation of men. And today he offers that to you who will believe. Choose to walk in the light. Believe in the light, the light of the world. Repent from your sin. That means to turn from the things that you sin, the things that you do, the things that you have uh, been convicted of, and turn to Him. And John Popper says it like this, The gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. That's what Jesus says. And then Popper follows it up with a short commentary. He says, It is hard to die. It is hard to hate your life in this world. It's hard to follow Jesus on the road that leads to the cross. But I'm going to ask you today that you would be saved. That if you're not a Christian, that you're not a believer, that Easter in 2020 would be your year. That Easter in the COVID-19 pandemic would be the year that God works in your life to save you. We would rejoice. 55 sign-ins on this viewing. We would all rejoice if you came to know Christ. Hundreds of people who are watching right now, if you came to know Jesus, you would be uh, welcomed into their arms as well as the kingdom of God. You would find your life in Christ. And the Father, according to this text, would honor you. Believe in Jesus Christ. I was reading this week, we have a Revolutionary War hero, um, which is our town's namesake, kind of, uh, Marquis de Lafayette, and um, he was a big Revolutionary War hero. I didn't realize how big he was until uh, this week as I was reading, but he had a family estate back in France uh, called Lagrange. And after the Revolutionary War, he was very instrumental in the Battle of Yorktown, where Cornwallis surrendered to effectively end the war. He moved back to France in 1783. And there were all these uh, French Revolution, the storming of the Bastille, Napoleon. A lot of things happened over there. Um, and later he returned to America to cheers and shouts and cities named after him and town halls renovated and, and parties, just all these things I was amazed by. But when he got back to France in 1783, he noticed that there was this huge blight on the crops. And his farm was basically unaffected. The crops in his area around his way, the blight hadn't affected them. And of course, the you know com or common sense economics is is pretty straight up. If the supply is low and you have a good supply, you need to sell because you're going to make a good profit. You know, if the supply is low, prices are going to go up. So one of Lafayette's friends came to him and said, "Hey, you know, now's the time to sell. You know, you can you can really make a buck if you would sell now when the blight is so hard." on the rest of the crops. But one of the things that Lafayette saw were servants in the area, were peasants in the area who were starving to death. And so he disagreed with his friend. He said, no, now's not the time to sell. Now is the time to give. And he decided not to sell his crops, but to give them away for the people. He gave up his profit for the benefit of others. He sacrificed personal gain for the well-being of his servants. His barns of plenty died that they would be multiplied among the people of the land. Jesus gave his life for you if you would believe in him. He looked upon starving lost sheep and became the great shepherd of your souls. He looked down upon rebels and enemies of God and offered terms of peace based on the death that he would die and on his resurrection. Trust in him today. He says to be born again. Be born again. Right where you are, call out to Jesus for a genuine life-giving relationship and forgiveness. Unless a grain of wheat fall into the earth and die, it will bring forth no fruit. Aren't you glad that Jesus died and that he rose again on Resurrection Sunday? Let me pray for you. 
Father in heaven, we thank you for that resurrection. We thank you for the fact that you have opened the eyes of blinded sinners like us, that you have let us see the beauty of the cross. And God, I pray that right now you would do the same. That for folks that may be watching this who don't see Jesus, God, that you would let them see Jesus for the first time high and lifted up. Let them see Jesus for the first time uh, glorified when he comes out of the tomb, alive and well, ready to ascend to his Father, having beaten death and hell in the grave, offering forgiveness because the, the debt has been paid on our behalf. God, we're thankful for that. Help us to receive that, to walk in that, to follow Jesus, to, to hate our lives that we may receive eternal life, to walk in the light, to be sons and daughters of light. God, we love you. Bless us in this resurrection day, for Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And it's in his name we pray. And amen. I want to thank you guys for joining with us. Thank you for your prayers uh, for our church during Easter. Know that we are praying for you. Um, this is not a time where we cease being the church because we're not there. In fact, I think maybe we're praying harder. Uh, we're ministering harder. We're making more phone calls. We're, we're doing what we can from where we are. Keep ministering. There's so many needs. We trust that God is going to do a work in us. Um, we don't hadn't had time to shake hands, shake hands with your family or do your holy fake high fives. Um, also we haven't had time to have some coffee and some lunch. I hope you have a great Easter dinner. We haven't had time to give. Don't forget that during this season of not being together in the church, that giving is still important. And so whether it's through your bank bill pay or whether it's through our website whether it's dropping a check off at the church, um, however you feel led to give, we appreciate that. And we God will bless you for your faithfulness in giving and continuing ministry while uh, we're not meeting together. If there's anything that I can do for you and your family, um, you please let me know. We've got deacons that are ministering as well. Our elders are meeting every few days, planning for what we do and how we do it. Um, they're taking everything into consideration that we know how to take and trying to make wise decisions for us as a church. We love you guys. Our, our family misses you. I hope you enjoyed the video from everyone. Watch it again. Share this uh, sermon. Share our music. Share our uh, Easter sunrise service. Let the gospel go forth on social media because you're here. Thank you, guys. It's great to be your pastor. Have a great Easter Resurrection Day.